Hello guys, um, welcome back to a space. This space would be the first into a follow-up to the current uh, help packages that Ukraine uh, is uh, slated to receive. Uh, these regard both uh, pledged equipment uh, and newly brought in equipment. So far, the Ukrainians uh, are basically tabling on receiving quite a large amount of cash uh, and uh, quite a large amount of equipment based on some of the uh, announcements that have been made. Uh, one of those, for instance, was today with Boris Pistorius announcing 500 million euros. The Belgians announcing 412 million euros, including... Uh, the continuation of the transfer of their own EVEC and MVs uh, basically had already delivered 80. They are going to deliver 200 more, plus, uh, according to who you listen, uh, 20 or more out of their own stock, uh, which is of between 400 to 420 vehicles. Um, then we have already a first batch of ASVs, so M1117, uh, which are armored security vehicles. These vehicles, as I said, are going probably to uh, contribute to uh, uh, an element uh, that I am going to explain uh, later in the, in the space. But most importantly, uh, we have had Greece that has pledged a hodgepodge um, bunch of systems from World War II, uh, 155 millimeter artillery to ammunition that so far doesn't fit any of the equipment that the Ukrainians have, including 90 millimeter uh, allegedly tank guns, uh, no, sorry, uh, tank ammunition. Uh, but it could very possibly be uh, that instead of uh, tank gun ammunition or anti-tank uh, ammunition, uh, it could fit with the uh, 90mm recoilless rifles that Ukrainians have a couple of uh, in this war. Now, one of the biggest problems I have with the current uh, stacking of uh, pledges and probably also transfers is that I do not see much of the uh, dreaded uh, supplies. My dread was 24 to 36 F-16s, maybe some Mirage 2000s, and uh, in really, in extreme cases, uh, some Gripens. Accordingly, given the Belgian uh, announcement for a mission of uh, eight weeks plus two F-16s uh, in two terms, so basically 16 weeks total and four F-16s uh, in Romania in order to train between uh, 48 and 64 uh, Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, it has been announced around 50, but basically knowing how the crews will need to operate, uh, it should be four pilots, and 44 ground personnel as a minimum. Uh, and on the other side, it should be also uh, a couple of people from Belgium or other countries that should be uh, embedded with the Ukrainians once they receive their uh, plane fleet. The Dutch have announced that this year they would send roughly uh, two to six planes. The Danes have announced that this year they would send two to six planes either. However, the article that you guys probably have uh, uh, read already about uh, the planes coming from July on, 
uh, speaks about only six existence. So it's very possible that uh, the Dutch sent four, Danes sent two, and then overall, after a uh, critical assessment of how the F-16s wor work, probably the, the Dutch are going to send the full 24 uh, squadron as they had promised. And uh, probably the Danes are going to also send the full uh, I think that it was 12 planes proposed. One big unknown seems to be the French um, deal. A lot of people spoke about the Mirage 2000. Still nothing in the air. However, the French have already sent at least 50 uh, ASMs. They are apparently sending uh, ASM-50s. Uh, sorry, ISM 250s, so basically a 250 kilogram bomb plus kit. Uh, so far, the modus operandi seems to be one or two ISM kits per MiG 29. I personally found that this is basically a waste of an already uh, very tricky to maintain platform for the Ukrainians, but probably uh, it is also a way to uh, minimize losses in the sense that you stay really just at the point of, of launch and you get the hell out. It's very possible that uh, this is also modus operandi for ha uh, harm missiles. And so far it has cost at least two planes, uh, one Su-27 and one MiG-29, including the one that we saw getting hit in the air by uh, R-37M. So overall, when it comes to the Ukrainian, uh, side right now, if we also take the statements from uh, the French, Polish, and German authorities about a coalition of tanks, and then Schultz talking about coalition of long-range artillery, it is obviously uh, clear that the, these people are not that stupid. They understand exactly what's going on, and although belatedly, they are getting the point that Ukrainians is not Ukrainians not only in need of artillery ammunition, but they are in need of troops, they are in need of uh, vehicles, and they are in need of um, mobility, protected mobility. This is the most important. This is something that the Russians, uh, unfortunately, are going backwards in the sense that uh, for a long while the Russians used uh, protected mobility with or without flows. That's something else. But now uh, everybody's preferring to be uh, light and fast on the Russian side. Desert cross usage is, of course, noticed, but more and more Patriots are used are used like that. More and more lighter vehicles are used like that. And, of course, this contributes positively to the uh, logistical footprints because instead of using, as I said, a huge protected armored vehicle of uh, 7 to 40 tons, like a RM diesel uh, STS said, you are going to use a uh, Patriot who has UAZ with uh, uh, maybe one-tenth of the needs when it comes to fuel, and you will be able to travel as far as. Of course, protection is a, a compromise, calculated or not, that's something else. But unfortunately for the uh, Russians, they seem to actually appreciate the way the op Ukrainians operated early in the war a lot more than what the Ukrainians are trying to do now probably uh, incentivized by the uh, NATO allies, which is systematically going under protection towards the fire. This, of course, doesn't change much to uh, the damage they're going to receive because most of the, the equipment that's being sent right now, for instance, the Iveco LMVs, the Russians had them and lost quite a few of them initially. Uh, we have seen the uh, Batu MGGs, from Germany, actually it's not from Germany, it was from the US, but basically sold via Germany. They also weren't able to sustain combat, although they provided protection from some small arms fire. Same deal with the senators, as I said, uh, they are, are supposed to have received thousands of them. I don't see them in the front lines. We saw a couple of them, I think three, uh, in the latest uh, Belgrade adventures. But most of these vehicles are not present in the front line and the Ukrainians are still dealing with shortages of uh, these protected vehicles and are 
forced to use uh, trucks and uh, pickups and SUVs as personal, uh, I'd say, means of mobility. Now, what does it say? To me, everything that I'm reading when it comes to ammunition, when it comes to artillery, when it comes to mobility and everything, is that indeed Ukrainians this time are going to have a lot more equipment than they had last year, but the build-up is going to be a lot slower. So instead of expecting any kind of counter from Ukraine uh, around June, July, probably by July they would have the first pieces of their uh, potential counterattack in September uh, 2024, depending, of course, on the situation on the ground. If the situation keeps going like this, for instance, today uh, the Ukrainians have completely lost Orlivka, which means that the flank, first flank, southern flank of Seminovka is completely fucked up. And the uh, Ukrainians are not defending in Berdyshi, they are uh, delaying on the cut line, which goes to the uh, northern flank of uh, Sevenovka. And usually they do that by uh, Bradley's. One of them was those today. So overall, what it seems like is that this time, Europeans are going to take more time, let the Ukrainians soak a lot of damage, and at earliest, any kind of counter is going to come on September, unless there is a cataclysmic change in the uh, kinematics of the Russian offensive, defensive, uh, and overall capabilities. Why am I a bit more concerned? Because this time, as I said, the Europeans are not making uh, stupid decisions. We are, have not any kind of announcement for we're going to get this tank, we're going to get this tank, we're going to get this artillery. No, they are keeping everything in the wraps, which makes, to be honest, my job as uh, analysts and our jobs at TVK as, as, as brainstorming completely different because um, we could surmise which kind of equipment is going to be given. But the announcement from Belgium, for instance, to completely get rid of, uh, of Kate, not, not completely, but 70% to get rid of, it, of its uh, infantry mobility vehicles, like the Iveco LMVs, is uh, particularly concerning in the sense that, okay, they're not getting, you know, uh, Wunderwaffe, but they're getting uh, quantity. So if everything goes right, they're going to have like 250 AC, uh, ASVs from America, they're going to have like 280 uh, in total, although they lost some, but roughly 280 uh, or 250 uh, EVEC LMVs. There's the, the new the Russians, the senators. You know, probably France is going to send some equipment, I hope lighter one, uh, just because the French do not have much to send at, as, as we speak. Uh, so at, at worst for Russia, it would be some new, uh, I'd say, uh, infantry-borne vehicles. Uh, so uh, let's say uh, a Jaguar. That's the worst case scenario. But France for it doesn't have them for itself. So very complicated to uh, to judge w w where Macron's going to stop because so far he hasn't done much, except of course for the uh, ASM 250. But on the other side, um, is the creation of hubs not far from Ukraine that's concerning, in the sense that. We have the huge base uh, that's being now started in uh, Romania. We have the French deployment in Romania as well. Um, probably, I already said this in 2022, that a lot of Polish uh, purchases from America uh, looked a lot like uh, preposition stocks. And given the latest uh, foreign military sales that were approved, so basically a long-range JASM AGM uh, 158, the B2s with uh, almost a thousand kilometers of range, clearly seem to indicate that some movements are there to uh, 
maybe give a little oomph to the Korean forces if there is need to uh, stop any kind of uh, Russian slow, either by hitting uh, within Russia itself, either by, uh, you know, doing a surprise attack on Russian uh, logistical centers and points within Ukraine. However, um, this is not a panic space, quite the contrary. I'm just saying like, right now I, I see that there's a change in tune. Uh, I do not see the capabilities, I mean, for the uh, tank coalition, there is so little that can be done uh, between Poland, Germany and France. Um, the French do not have the capability to uh, reproduce uh, nuclears anymore, uh, in any kind of scale, by the way. So they ha we'll have to restart the whole process. It would last between six and twelve months just to uh, be able to recut um, patterns. Then the Germans, given they had the Italian order of almost two hundred eighty vehicles, uh, will have to say to the Italians, guys, no. Uh, the Poles, well, we saw what it gives. Um, if they want to give more T91Ms and stuff like that, or start remanufacturing uh, obsolete vehicles, that could also be a logic, but I do not think that the Poles have that kind of uh, thought process in their minds. However, there are the 116 uh, FAP, M1A1 FAP tanks. Those could, as, could, as I said, probably be given to Ukraine in a sense or another, uh, and that would nicely... Um, be able to afford the Ukrainians almost two uh, uh, tank brigades, let's say it like this. Generally speaking, there is no change there yet. So the Americans are far from uh, their alleged objectives of uh, 1.2 million uh, rounds a year. We do not see also a crescendo of production when it comes to uh, HIMARS uh, rockets and also the HIMARS rockets recently have been completely a wall. <laughs> like uh, we are down to maybe seven strikes. I already spoke about this seven strikes per three, four days, even a week. And this has nothing to do with uh, actually GPS. I think it has to do with the fact that a couple of them got the boot. And it's been the last 70 something days. Uh, we saw if everybody you know con looks properly. There were two very early in January. Uh, we saw them being evacuated, one hit by a uh, cluster ammunition. The other one had blown up into a mine after it, it was going out of the position because it was spotted. Um, then we had. Uh, one shown by the Russian Ministry of Defense, which wasn't very conclusive, but I believe them uh, in that sense because they always show something going up. It might not always be what we think. Just remember the story of the Patriots that were mislabeled as uh, uh, S-300 and then an S-300 that was mislabeled as a Patriot. But the reality is that an S-300 was blown and a Patriot uh, component of a battery was blown as well. So, so far, no lies, maybe misconception, but in the same case, when it comes to uh, the HIMARS story, is that right now they are trying to fire from uh, relative safety. Then, once again, there was this whole story about the Russians gaining better ISR and stuff like that. As I said to you guys, I do not believe that because Russians had always done these operations, it's just that now they're showing them a lot more. But on the Ukrainian side right now, we are seeing these drone attacks on uh, refineries. Today, I reposted another uh, lewd drone that failed in Kaluga. Uh, one hit uh, a pipe, no detonation. They could recover most of the drone. Another got snagged probably on a higher pipe. That wasn't the objective, but given that the wingspan is absolutely uh, humongous, as I said, it's seven meters probably got snagged, uh, started to spin and then crashed without being able to uh, to explode. And Warhead has also uh, taken apart 
Then we have the uh, other bad uh, drones that are being now uh, fought by uh, electronic warfare. And we have finally the latest uh, attacks uh, in Voronezh that were all shot down. Giving a bit of more credence to what I said, some of the people were not taking uh, the story uh, seriously, both you know the intra moral politics with maybe the Russian government trying to stifle uh, the uh, you know belligerency from uh, oil producers because, as you know, they declared from first of March a six month ban on exports for uh, uh, gasoline. Therefore, uh, this is a way of uh, dealing with the situation. So basically, you see, trust me, I can protect your refineries, but if you don't play fair, then, well, we'll just let the drones through. It would be problematic if uh, Putin does that, but I, I, I just think that the Russians uh, have, as I said, uh, overcapsule. They are going to first absorb some some blows they have done this uh, the whole for the whole of this war but also historically and then they're gonna try to find a solution or for gonna find a solution in this case i think the solution for those specific drones of the loot given their size given their uh rather signature well it's not very complicated to shoot them down it's just having the um uh, air defenses on point uh, at the time that this uh, uh crap flies now when it comes to you can Elsewhere, we are also seeing something different, is that um, the EU is trying to use the proceeds uh, from quote-unquote Russian frozen assets. I uh, sent into the group uh, a article dated end of February, early March, over the legal problems that would cause to even think about taking Russian profits, not uh, Euroclear profits in this case, because what we is, has been spoken uh, so far is an obfuscation of the reality. Clearly, what is being targeted right now is um, reinvestment of profits from uh, Euroclear, profits that it has made on Russian money. So its money is being targeted for uh, a windfall tax. Euroclear itself can say, okay, I'm not, I'm not agreeing with this because it, a windfall tax most illegally is when you are having a boon uh, that is unexpected and it's mostly due to uh, specific market situations. A couple of windfall taxes happened to uh, PPE uh, manufacturers and PPE traders uh, during the COVID years because a lot of money was made simply by shuffling uh, masks, uh, gloves, gowns, stuff like that. In this case, it's just the same. The maturity of Russian assets and the proceeds from the maturity of these assets, given that uh, Euroclear could not send most of it uh, back were of course uh, inventorized but the profits the record profits that normally you know like you they should have been given to russia and then russia would have decided if they want to sell or not those profits that are not russia's but uh, euroclear in this case those are going to be basically uh, seized euroclear as i said can always uh, attempt to resist but i don't think they will do simply because politically it would be untenable for them uh, while on the other side, the Russian profits, the real ones, so those that are uh, linked directly with the Russian assets, are simply not possible to be touched without a litigation. However, the Europeans, they don't care, honestly, if they are taxing Russian proceeds or Euroclear proceeds at the end, uh, attacking Euroclear and slapping with a windfall tax uh, helps them get some money. So on that aspect, as I said, Ukraine might see a bit more money coming on its way, but it's still not, clearly not enough because it would be around three to four uh, billion euros uh, maximum per year. And it is 
only uh, doable after the legislation is passed. It's not retroactive. So the proceeds that might uh, be seized by the European uh, Commission in this case would be starting from June 2024. And then for the first month it would be July. And by July, the uh, Ukrainians could receive uh, these mm, monies, which would be then more or less, more or less legally uh, acceptable. So in a sense, everybody is gearing up to something that they weren't expecting uh, in Europe. Basically, Russian resilience, um, Ukrainian stupidity, and, well, a way for Russia to find possibilities to still not only sustain the war, but also make it worse for Ukraine. And in this part, most important, as, as we uh, said, is the fact that Russia right now has a complete uh, disparity in means and deep strikes where Ukrainians need to fly some shitty drones. And once again, doesn't mean that they're shitty, they're not dangerous. I'm just saying that uh, Ukraine is going to send maybe 15 per, per night in order to, for one or two of them to strike. Uh, and they are going to find... Uh, specific targets, soft targets, completely different from uh, the very mixed up and up targeting from the Russian uh, side, where the Geranians are going more and more, and it is being proven more and more towards military or dual purpose targets. Um, targets stri stri uh, stricken by uh, Ukraine right now, they are mostly. Um, valid in a sense because the Ukrainians for them it's a, a total war but they're mostly trying to hit uh, Russia's revenues so in military military terms it doesn't change that much in cost terms the repair is a problem lack of production is a problem but as I said the, the issue is that Russia can always profit from these strikes given they affect the oil price okay not by much but still and then can shuffle this oil more expensively, but also can uh, have this offset uh, principle, that, as I told you, that they can are going to sell the Chinese uh, oil, and they would uh, would like to uh, have from the Chinese diesel or gasoline instead of uh, receiving money. As I said, this is a very interesting trade because, first of all, it cements the relationship, and for the Chinese, they can start understanding how far the Russians will go, but this works also with Belarus, can also work with India, and so on and so on. This allows the Russians not to lose money. They're going to give a product, so basically they're not going to earn as much money as they wanted. But the point is, the money is not lost. You are gaining it in a different way. There is a win-win situation. Instead of Russians sending oil there, and then suddenly they need to rebuy oil from the Chinese, the principle there is a, a repurchase with a re-exportation from the Chinese. Also interesting, but it would be uh, done with a hard currency in this case. While this kind of barter offset is more interesting and uh, can also be more fungible because you never know what's going in and out. You can hide the level of uh, cooperation in this case. Most importantly, when it comes to Ukraine, is how the Ukrainians are going to solve, because with the new vehicles that are going to come, uh, the hike in consumption of uh, petroleum, petroleum pro uh, products, so basically diesel, uh, gasoline, uh, different fluids, and so on and so on, that will go up. Right now, everybody was gangsta riding on Buhankas, on L200s, on whatever you name it, um, but suddenly they're going to have an influx of heavier vehicles with a different consumption rate, with a different approach also to uh, maintenance and so on. And basically we had the issue with the fact that the Americans had sent all, over 400 vehicles to uh, Ukraine, armored vehicles, and without actually a plan to sustain them. So in this case... <laughs> Let's see where the coalition is going. The announcements uh, are telling me that this time is going to be a lot more complicated. 
to uh, you know completely see where the Ukrainians will go. Uh, the pledges, the deliveries and so on are going to be slower. So a longer time will be needed. This is always a problem, as you know, because uh, you are in the middle of an attrition war uh, and receiving equipment on a longer term allows also the Russians to do more damage to you, especially when some equipment that is extremely uh, necessary, like air defense systems, is not there, so the Russians might enjoy a longer uh, air dominance, let's say like this, uh, when it comes to striking uh, targets with higher level ordnance. So basically, when they're going to drop uh, UMPKs, uh, 500, 1,500, um, for an extra three, four months, the damage, especially at the front line, but also uh, immediately after the front line is going to be absolutely damning. Now, how, how do I see where we're going with um, Ukraine? What are, are the plans? So far, we're not seeing new units. And this is logical because the, the people are not there. Most of the existing units will need to just be replenished, rotated, and probably if things go the way I'm seeing it, part of the mass mobilization that uh, the Americans want the Ukrainians to commit to uh, is going to be done through a uh, partial demobilization. I know what a lot of people are going to say, what the fuck are you saying? Yes. There are people that now for two years have been getting hammered. Um, a lot of them are ideological, so they don't give a fuck. They are already fucked up in their mind, and those people, you cannot demobilize them. You will have to kill them. Russians will have to finish them. But on another aspect, um, when it comes to... Uh, people that were part of the first wave but that have undergone terrible things like guys the if you saw my post on the 46 uh, those were literally completely poured into acid and, and, and disappeared they had to be attached to another uh, major unit to be reformed in any kind of uh, way but they literally disappeared in Bahmut. And this is one of the biggest problems with the Ukrainian military right now. A lot of people that supported the house that kept the roof on of this military are gone or are unable to continue. The toll that two years of conflict are going to take on some of these people, because it, it's not... I, I would like also people to reimagine, this is not like some uh, shitty Iraqi uh, police action when after one and a half month of uh, combat, you control the country more or less, you put your own government and what follows up is an insurgency, which might be even worse uh, for soldiers. I'm not saying that the Iraq insurgency was the burden, but here you have people getting bombed, FPV'd, iskander tanked, whatever you want. It's a completely different scenario. It's still open warfare and, and both sides have a lot of ordnance to, to hurt uh, one another. But the problem with Ukraine right now is that they will need to discharge, I discussed this uh, on private conversation, at least 40,000 people a year. And I think those are, will have to be the more, more vulnerable. And within two to three years is even worse. So raging on, uh, this small discharge would help also with the tax pool. I had envisioned a larger discharge between 60 and 120,000 for the first year in order to maintain the balance because you're going to you know, put people in without releasing people back to the society. Okay, it's, it's, it's a problem as well because, okay, these guys have been fighting for two years. You're going to reintroduce them to civil life. How are they going to perform? Are they going to be like a, a um, complete disaster? Um, lacking social skills, having huge problems to readapt, PTSD, all this shit, 
or are these people going to fit more or less, be more calm, and also give a different approach to um, the social life within Ukraine, because this is one of the things that also you need to understand. Um, there are areas where the military commissars that come to snatch people or come to uh, get people to uh, enlist are hated. Like, more and more videos are coming when these guys are using literally uh, kidnapping tactics to put people on the front. This, unfortunately, as well for us, is not the majority. Um, I posted the article where in this video there were quote-unquote no more men. But most of the uh, enlistment, enrollment in the Ukrainian army, it's, it's just apathetic. People don't like it, they dread it, they're afraid, but they still go there in far lesser numbers than it was 2022 and up to the middle of 2023, but it's still ongoing. There's still a trickle-down effect. And then you got more and more outliers, uh, extremely problematic cases with people fleeing, people getting beat up, videos from all families going there, uh, uh, military commissars literally grabbing guys who are outside for a light night stack. I posted a video uh, waiting for people in Kharkov, for instance, at the exit of the metro and stuff like that. So all this exists, but on the other side, it's not the majority of the cases. We need to admit this, otherwise the, the military structure would have crumbled by now. There might be a ticking bomb, that's for sure. You can see with the way things are going. There might be a ticking bomb. I'm not saying the country, but the biggest problem right now is not as much a ticking bomb as the problem that any, everything in Ukraine right now is unsatisfactory and it's causing losses. Maybe it's not what people think these losses are, like they're losing 10,000 guys a, a week and the Russians are completely tearing the front down. No, but the sustainment process down the road is not there anymore. This is certainty, and you can see how it's going. They staged a uh, stubborn defense of Tolenke, uh, Orlovka, and Berdyshi, and right now that thing is being bypassed. And once the first line falls, as I said, then you're going to have the second line, then the third line, but the risk is that the first line falls, the Russians push uh, towards Ocheretino from the south, then Ukrainians would need to completely defend uh, towards Nova Motivka. And the whole point, you know, restarts and shows the exact same uh, panic that uh, grabbed the Ukrainians uh, end of February when the, their line in uh, Avdivka completely crumbled. So this is what's going to happen. It's not as much like a complete rout of the army and people are going to start fleeing. It's just the pressure from the Russian side is not going to stand there. Of course, there are other problems in this case. It's, it's just not rosy for the Russians, there are still tactical mistakes, there are still uh, logistical issues. Uh, some of the things that we were talking about on the Russian side, which is a um, imp importance of dealing with the FPVs, that's going to fucking last. And probably it's going to get worse for both sides. Uh, you guys probably uh, had this more except with uh, the Ukrainian uh, Warfare, electronic warfare analyst, Sergei Flash, who said that within four or five months, both sides are going to start hunting even individual soldiers with uh, FPVs. This, of course, regards infantry combat, for which the Russians are going to deal differently from now on, because, you know, the whole point that's happening with the Russian advances and Russian fighting is that the Russians cannot get to the first line with their full force due to the FPVs attacking the, the vehicles and then starting to scramble the foot mobiles. But on the other side, Ukrainians cannot also mount great counteroffensive because they get FPV just the same. And when they try to accumulate uh, to move up uh, down the line, well, 90% of the time there is a fab falling close enough, if not straight on them, that makes that, that stuff impossible. So is, you're going to have this grinding match with all this stalling uh, on the Russian side and a grinding match with all the 
uh, stalling on the Ukrainian side. Now this contributes to extreme losses for the kind of battles that are left. So basically you're gonna have two to three hundred guys being busy taking a shitty uh, city like uh, um, fuck uh, Novomikhailivka which like I think it's about nine to fifteen thousand people and then you have also a huge amount of people trying to get Avdivka. Then you got another uh, huge amount of people that are going to be busy taking a, a small line of maybe 20 kilometers that is well defended by Ukrainians. And then the most, uh, of course, telling example is Terny and Yampolivka. The Russians are there like at 800 meters from each of, of uh, both these localities, but they, they cannot advance. Because as I said, both sides have enough uh, damage assets for the assaulters, which means that assaulting, attacking is going to be more and more difficult from both sides. Unless, as I said, the Russians have that air defense breakthrough and can uh, start stacking up multiple bombs. One of the good uh, aspects of it would be, uh, as I said, that the UMPB-30, with its uh, lighter weight and better guidance uh, from the uh, kits that were found, would allow multiple strikes from the same aircraft. So basically, you can fly with six UMPBs, two planes, that's 12 uh, bombs, instead of having now the maximum of eight bombs for two planes. But of course, those eight bombs are uh, more dangerous in the sense that if you have eight uh, UMPK for uh, 500, you are unleashing roughly 2,000 kilograms of explosive with the MPBs, 12, you are basically not even going to 1,100 kilograms. So, but the, the flexibility of the smaller bombs, like, uh, small diameter bombs on the American side means that the Russians can drop them more frequently and they can also attack uh, multiple positions with a uh, four planes team you're going to drop 24 uh, whereas you would only drop uh, 16 with uh, UMPKs and those 24s you can start to saturate the whole area instead of having one or two bombs uh, blowing uh, a 20 meter, 30 meter difference, you're going to have all these uh, UMPBs being closer, more uh, tactful, and also allowing you to use them for other uh, purposes, given that apparently the range is way higher than uh, the uh, UMP, uh, UMPK, the current UMPK, which is limited to about 7 kilometers maximum from my altitude. So, The Russians still have the tools to make a difference. The problem is that it will not make much of a difference on the ground because the airstrikes um, are still designed to grind. They are not designed to be tactically re relevant, although the Russians are showing other assets like the Moor, like this Delhi 85 that we saw uh, hit helicopters over 60 kilometers away. Therefore, that's why I say the Russians need to reassert and reinvest on their own and on this air power that has been lacking for two years now, although they've found solutions. On the Ukrainian side, the air power coming up is not enough anyway. So if the Russians are getting a little bit higher, so having assets they can deploy by helicopters or even deploy by uh, aircraft, and having a good standoff range, then the Ukrainians would need Serious numbers as their craft. So, 80 uh, F-16s would be the strict minimum instead of being the optimum, as said by, said by Ignat. Plus, you need to park them, you need to uh, service them. And given how it's working for uh, the Belgian mission, when 50 guys are, are needed for two F-16s, then you can imagine if you uh, put 25 people to deal with one plane and you have 80 planes, you're going to have a huge uh, inf inflation in people 
also a few, huge reflection in footprint, uh, where this plane is going to be stationed, how these planes are going to be uh, dealt with, and also more planes would mean more activity, more activity would mean in Russian interest, and so on and so on. So, so far, it's true that Europeans are doing things slightly differently uh, than last year when I think they tried to rush everything instead of, you know, postponing them. It's not what happened. I think the plan was bad, but they said, if you rush it, Russians are completely fucked up. They have no more, uh, uh, I'd say, willpower. They are reeling from two big losses, Kharkov and Kherson. Uh, they are not ready yet. Let's go. We're going to break through and definitely end the war. Now everything is being done differently. Uh, the ammunition story, vehicle story. Now we hear about long-range artillery, which uh, was never spoken about. I mean, you can see uh, we show we showed with the Timor criminal multiple uh, elements of a popularization of the artillery uh, wing or arm of the Ukrainian army. When a Polish guy went there and checked them, they were with seven seven sevens. Fast forward five months, they're back to D20s, which, I mean, it's quite the downgrade uh, in a certain sense. Uh, similarly, they had this, the Ukrainians themselves had this uh, uh, footage about them uh, using a captured MS S, uh, for which they uh, apparently produced barrels or scrap barrels. I don't know how it works, but probably. They do that in, in Slovakia. Uh, but they previously had a crab, and you could see the crab also being blown up. So the attrition is real on the on the uh, artillery side. I've already spoken about this, and the fact that finally it's being uh, noticed and spoken about from the Europeans is very important, because to correct it, you need assets that for now the European Union and the Americans cannot account for. If we put every single barrel system together that can be produced per year, we may be going to scrap about six to 700 pieces by delivering everything. But the production and the expanse of the production lines to be able to put the six to 700 would mean that you will pay them on average uh, 12 to 13 million, because we're speaking completely different systems. You're not dealing with the Panzer Halbitz 2000, which are 45 million euros. No, you're dealing with something different, like a Caesar, a Bogdan, and so on. But in the meanwhile, this year alone, from footage, you have lost, as SPGs, at least about 50 Okay, let's say half of them. Let's say 30. You are still going to fire more of them, so your staying power goes down and down and down and down and down. Plus, if right now you can deal with 155, because not all your, all your guns are 155, you're still using a huge... Uh, um, number of 122s, Vodzikas, D30s, and 152s, uh, D20s, and so on. This means that you are still not burning enough per barrel because you don't have enough barrels to burn all this stuff. But if you start having only 155s, okay, you're going to pay 2 to 3 billion euros to build all this shit, plus an investment of different manufacturers for at least also 5 billion in order to have a possibility to produce more of these. That's eight billion just to, to deal with that as a minimum, plus the, art, the artillery ammunition that needs to go on and so on and so on and so on and so on. So you're looking at ten to twelve billion euros just for artillery, which is going to be just enough given the expenses, and the losses, and the damages. If you're going to lose three to four hundred a year, one hundred fifty-five, plus you're going to shoot the rest out of it, you are going to have a deficit of barrels every single year. 
and don't forget all this needs to be done with a industrial tooling that need to be rentabilized down the fucking road you cannot build a fucking 50 billion factory and start shitting barrels and suddenly after two years the war is ending uh, you have a, a stalemate most disadvantaged to Ukraine and then what? This is one of the big things that finally like works for Russia given they've lost a fuck ton of material they will have a few years to re to rearm on the back of it so uh, their militarization makes sense plus even if they win the war or if they lose the war either it's going to be a uh, revanchism within the Russian society either there's going to be a even deeper paranoia because uh, Euro the Europeans are not going to accept them and they're going to start uh, producing even more vitriol against Russia. So on that aspect, the Russians are on this path of um, military investment because they are the, the ones who are fighting this war. But in France, who is going to like be the French... Napoleon, I mean, Macron is talking a lot, but Germany, what is Germany going to do? They are already slated 100 billion euros for four years. Then what? Then we are going to go through uh, this whole lunacy of 3% GDP, where the Europeans, as I said, are already losing about 150 to 180 billion on prices alone. I lost... Uh, uh, GDP growth and then you're going to spend another 100 uh, and, and 780 on defense which by essence when you're not fighting is completely useless so what apparently everybody believes that Europeans are going to do this they, they basically are going to sustain this because uh, for some reason Russia is now an existential threat and then Nobody else can, uh, I'd say, trust Russia of stopping after defeating Ukraine. Okay, this scaremongering is fine and everything, and in a sense I also understand that the point is for them not as much to scaremonger because it's going to be a war after Ukraine. The point is to scaremonger so they can intervene at some point to save whatever can be saved of Ukraine. Um, however, The rest of it, as I said, right now is not advanced enough to, to have this kind of lecture of the uh, European options. Of course, there's always the options for these guys to uh, go on a completely uh, not adventure and drop five, six thousand, as I said, on, on Odessa, cut through, drop fifty, sixty thousand uh, from Poland, and then like go on defilade from the, the Belarusian territory or uh, deploy troops from uh, Slovakia or deploy, deploy troops from Hungary, which, of course, will not happen for as long as our is going to be there. So, right now, there are no signs of NATO intervening. As since there's a lot of blah, blah, Macron does his usual shit, but there, it's not there. What is, though, there and is a more grounded approach, a lot more equipment given in order for um, Ukrainians to have at least some kind of streamlining, like to, uh, 280 Ivecos is in a lot and facilitates a pooling of, of means. Uh, the ISVs, of course, it's a more quirky vehicle, but still, there are still a lot of them to be able also to self-sustain by cannibalization. Uh, and then we will see with the German uh, help, we'll see with the rest of the help. It feels like we are touching the, the bottom of the barrel, but when you analyze it properly, they are still targeting some weak points of the Ukrainian army, which is protected mobility, which is um, tactically sound choices. Like, it makes no sense to send a huge-ass MATV 
because an FPV is still going to fry your engine, so it's going to be a huge uh, obstacle in the middle of anywhere. Same for the Volvo Fount, same for the Max Pros. These heavier vehicles are fine if you are in a different environment. They are just moving barns waiting to get FPV'd in Ukraine or hit by artillery or whatever you want. So vehicles more like Russian and so on, of course, are less protective and it's really a shit vehicle, honestly. But they are supposedly cheaper, although they are sold in absolutely mindless prices. They are cheaper, they can be sustained because the chassis used for them is not ad hoc. It's shitty Ford F-150, uh, stuff like that. So all this is useful, is logic, is something that can help Ukraine. But you still need the rest, you need the tanks, you need the artillery and so on. And that part right now we haven't seen anything. Because even the Americans started a very small project of uh, less than $50 million for the 777. And probably would be a new test batch with a couple of changes. <sighs> Anywhere from uh, 20 to 50 pieces. Uh, and then the rest of the equipment is going to be uh, done in uh, uh, America itself. So all this indicates that we aren't there yet. There is no great armament, there's no visibility, but steps are being taken at least for some of the problems that, that can be solved immediately. But these solutions, they have another cost. As I said, then you need to uh, be sure about your logistics because right now you can put like two fucking jugs in a, a Caravelle or a, a, a Renault traffic and then can do this uh, hush hush refueling of tanks, of uh, uh, maps or whatever, but once every single part of your uh, military lineup is heavy-duty vehicles of between 8 and 14 tons minimum, then your expenses uh, in fuel and lubricants, but also the way you deal with them, because while you can pull out some shitty uh, Dacia Duster or a uh, Volkswagen Tiguan or whatever you want to use it in Ukraine, with another shitty car, once your uh, map of 15 tons is stuck, you need proper ARVs. And then we see these idiots uh, wasting them in Belgorod. That also like, is something that Ukraine needs to solve. So all these small little elements are showing that maybe, maybe, maybe uh, the West is a bit more serious this time, but that will also... Uh, request more time. That's why the Ukrainians are building these uh, absolutely mindless uh, fortifications. But this is one thing that I, I, I think I'll have to uh, check and all the, the whole crew will have to check when it comes to what's coming in, what's coming out. Because while firepower hasn't changed that much, what is 100% sure is uh, that mobility uh, and protection at the lower level is going to probably play a big role for, for Ukraine um, moving forward, especially if they want to try something uh, of a counter still this year, but probably next year. However, the, as I said, the delivery must change. The delivery tempo for Ukraine must change. I mean, like we, we are speaking about stuff that exists. So the Belgians dropping 250 vehicles, it's not a problem. They have them. Uh, the Americans dropping these ISVs, they have them. If the Americans drop another two, three hundred Ab Abrams, they will have them. Four or five hundred more uh, Bradleys, they will have them. But the rest is not there. So what do you do with Leopard 2s? Um, as I said, capacity of uh, the German MiG is completely floored. Now there is talk about building uh, factories within Ukraine. Of course, this is bullshit because it would take uh, a whole uh, a whole ecosystem to be built. However, what is less bullshit is um, a vision on the European side that maybe it's worthy 
to try and attract the Russian army by saying whatever we have to the Ukrainians, they are doing the dying, they are doing also the damaging of the Russian army, and then we scoop back with whatever we have. That could be a logic, but still the level of production on the European MiG generally is abysmal, so that too is a huge problem. Because if you want to you know, square yourself purely when it comes to um, uh, non-contact means, I don't think the, the Europeans are going to risk uh, the shit show that both sides are having right now with FPVs, sending soldiers on food, sell, selling soldiers on golf carts, uh, sending soldiers on uh, quads, sending soldiers on uh, absolutely trashy vehicles. This will, this cannot fly with the Western militaries. I mean, if you don't have like 12 to 15 millimeters of armor around you, nobody's going to fucking jump on them except for uh, special forces. But we saw even the fucking Coyote from Supercat was fucked by the uh, Russians in Avdivka, I think. So the protection problem in, in Ukraine on both sides right now is just showing how um, problematic it is going to be for Europe especially to be able to sustain uh, Ukraine when it comes to heavy armor. If you see the losses, at least those counted, Ukraine should be at over 800 tanks minimum. Don't forget they've lost some prime chops, them, some prime cuts. They, they have lost Abrams. They've lost Abrams in the worst way possible. One of those was toast by a cornet in a supposedly protected place. Another got fucked completely by FPVs. Uh, a third one was uh, had its, its track blown on a mine and then finished by RPG or immobilized by RPG, further immobilized by RPG. So all these little steps show exactly what the problem is for uh, Ukraine right now and for the forces that would like to engage themselves in the Ukrainian war. Both sides have enough shit to blow whatever you're going to line up against them, except for uh, the Air Force. The problem is that Russia has a rather extensive air defense. So, on top of long-range fires, on top of a not so shabby ISR right now. So that's the that's the problem that's there. Most of the troops from Europe are going to be in an expeditionary mode. Therefore, it's not like they just can cross the border and they're there, except for Poland, of course, and probably Romania. But I don't think the Romanians are going to start uh, wasting their uh, their troops like that. Every single one of the powers that would like to intervene, be that the Chihuahuas up north or France, or the UK, they will have to come close. They will have to have their own uh, logistical problems. And when it comes to the UK or France, the real logistical bases are going to be 2,000 kilometers from there. So they will have to stockpile, and therefore, if that war starts, then the stockpiles are going to go up. As I said, this is the problem. This has always been the problem historically fighting against Russia. You had to move to Russia. So now a uh, bit more of a tactical approach. Um, right now, I, I do not see exactly what Ukraine wants to do. I mean, the Russians are grinding forward. It's narrow. It's scruffy. It's not good looking, but they're inching forward and it costs lives on both sides. And also right now, what is ab absolutely obvious is that the Russians for some reason have found the uh, golden number for uh, Ukrainian artillery. And Ukrainians bring more artillery to get blown up. I won't. I, I will check war spotting there, but I think that for a while now we have a huge problem with the Russians uh, getting to the same level of destruction when it comes to artillery than 
what the Ukrainians would inflict to them months ago. And one of the biggest absentees, I mean, look at your timelines, is HIMARS. And I repeat, this is because those motherfuckers were tapped and they are scared, they don't know what's going on. To the point that now they are pointing bullshit out, like, oh, someone is selling uh, satellite imagery to the Russians. It's not, I told you guys. It's very simple. The Russians now have access to their own imagery, they have also deals with China, and they have managed to implement a ghetto-style uh, short-term C2 communication lines. The fact that, unlike what happened last year in uh, uh, connection between Wagner and China when it came to imagery, this year they don't do that. The Americans are not trying to get the Chinese as the scapegoats. They are going by, oh, there are private companies selling uh, imagery, real-time imagery to Russia. To my opinion, none of the strikes that we've seen right now, unless there is some damage that the Ukrainians do not, uh, don't want to admit because, uh, you know, long strikes from the Russians are actually effective. All of the strikes that we've seen right now, it's not it's 50, 60, 70 kilometers behind line and can perfectly be explained by uh, Russia's own capabilities because the drones that surveyed this equipment getting blown up, the helicopters, the HIMARS, the uh, air defense and so on, those were Russian drones flying there. So this is where the bug breaks um, for the U.S. The small respite that the Russians got by hitting those high marshes is being transformed into a fucking massacre of the direct real line uh, for the Ukrainian side. And they're saying it. They're not lying about it. Of course, they're exaggerating shit like we had uh, the spokesman, uh, spokesman or uh, the responsible for air defense saying like 3,500 3, UMPKs had been dropped for the uh, last 80 days. We have now numbers, serial numbers, because that's the thing with the Russians. They are, have, are being extremely transparent. I think it could also be a... Um, uh, black PR for them saying, oh, we have th that, that many. But if we have to be uh, logical, then indeed, as I said, we can see that the first two months, 1,100 kits were produced, which is a bit more than half of what the Ukrainians uh, spoke about. Let's say that you have still some remnants from the production of December, which tr is translated to uh, the 1,093rd uh, kit being used the 10th of March, you can have what three, four, five hundred more. So overall, we are 2002, 2003 kits that might have been dropped, which is huge, by the way, for this kind of war. It's like they can treat whole areas and just fucking sow and sow and sow and then reap the successes. But this thing needs to go above the thousand systematically, not 400 in uh, November 2000. So all this needs to change. Uh, guys, today there's not going to be a Q&A because I'm going to have a Q&A uh, later, in two hours later. I would like to check something with a, uh, a source uh, according to who uh, the Russians are uh, targeting. Uh, now Chernigov, uh, the last week or so, the last 10 days, and uh, this makes no sense to me, so I would like to, to check that forward, and then we're going to have probably a small scoop. But, yeah, thank you very much, guys. Uh, have a nice day.